One of the dirty secrets about the dissident right is that many of us started out watching the Gamergate partisans. We are ashamed to admit this because we are embarrassed to have ever liked these people. These people aren't exactly known for being deep thinkers, and we wouldn't consider them to be role models in any way. Also, there is a mutual enmity between the various reactionary groups and the old anti-SGWs, or skeptics, or liberalists, or whatever they're calling themselves now. Despite our common opposition to the left, we tend to clash with each other more often than not. Perhaps this is why being called a right-wing SJW is so annoying. The moment this accusation comes out of someone's mouth, it immediately demonstrates a lack of original thought on the part of the accuser. In this way, anti-SJWs remind me of the new atheist skeptic phenomenon. They never argued for any positive worldview, any moral system. Instead, they attack their enemy's worldview while pretending that their position is just the default. They understand neither what they are opposed to, nor what they are for. But I suppose I should back up a bit. When I had my political awakening in 2016, I began by watching these anti-SJWs. I watched conservatives like Ben Shapiro and Steven Crowder, liberalists like Sargon of Akkad and V. Monroe, and moderate leftists like Chris Ray Gunn and the rest of the hashtag Gamergate crowd. They provided me with plenty of reasons why social justice warriors were stupid or evil or just a bunch of killjoys. Why couldn't they just let us play our video games? Why did they advocate for socialism, a failed economic system that's never worked whenever it's been tried? After a while, the formula became predictable. They'd bellyache for 15 minutes before concluding with some snappy one-liner. I always left their videos feeling a sense of smug satisfaction, and that was their intent. They want you to feel superior to those they are mocking on screen. I eventually became disillusioned with these types of people. You could only hear feminism is stupid so many times before you start to get bored. It seems like many of these people have not advanced one iota from where they were in 2016. All of their content just sort of blends together into a bunch of meh. More than anything, I believe the sameness of their videos represents a lack of curiosity. The curious mind moves topic to topic trying to look for a new perspective. Theirs never did. So, I started paying attention to the more radical voices on the right and never looked back. It wasn't until I came across a YouTuber named Louis Levi that I started to realize the serious problems with the anti-SJWs. In one video, he tries to argue that video game companies should fire anyone that tries to push a woke agenda effectively advocating for discrimination based on political beliefs. But then, in another video, he berates conservatives opposed to pornography as hypocritical and embarrassing to the cause of freedom. Pot, meat, kettle. He berates Carl Benjamin for not defending erotic depictions of underage girls in Japanese media as a matter of free speech. Then he complains about progressives promoting pedophilia. Again, pot, meat, kettle. But his most egregious videos are the ones attacking fence setters like Chris Ray Gunn and Angry Joe, two other YouTubers who dislike wokeness but refuse to comment on politics. He berates them as cowards for not calling out the woke agenda in gaming, but he has yet to consider the centrist question. Why should they join Louis in his crusade? I mean, think about things from their perspective. Supporting Louis' cause would be risky for their career prospects, and they have little to gain for it. Furthermore, nothing Louis is suggesting will be effective. Criticizing the progressive agenda won't make it go away. Voting Republican is a waste of time. The only thing that would work is, ironically, Louis' suggestion of removing these SJWs from position of influence. 
but this would be very difficult under the current political regime in which every corporation has to have an HR department. So, Louis has no way of convincing these people to side with him. He has no answer to the centrist question. The more I watched videos like his, the more I realized how little time people like Louis spent on thinking and how much they focused on smugly debunking their opponents. I believe the blindness exhibited by Louis and others like him is the result of these people having a negative worldview, being defined more by what they oppose than what they are for. It's no small coincidence that a lot of these anti-SJW types got their start as new atheists. It's easy to make the switch from laughing at Christian cringe to laughing at feminist cringe, and like the new atheists, they argue against things without knowing the arguments on the other side while using premises that are assumed rather than argued for. The same vacuous grandiloquence is at the core of both movements. Besides this blindness, I found the anti-SJW's priorities to be skewed. They fixated on things that influenced comic books and video games. Events like Gamergate and Comicsgate show this. The narratives of both movements were very similar. The industry was doing just fine until those evil SJWs came out of nowhere and messed everything up. But besides making crappier stories, why should we care about these pop culture consumer goods? What about the meaning of life? What about identity? What about the common good? All of these considerations together led me to ask myself, what lies at behind the anti-SJW in their odd crusade? As I dug through the obscure tomes of philosophy, I came across a startling answer. What laid behind the anti-SJW phenomenon was the failed ideology of liberalism. Now, when I say liberalism failed, what do I mean by this? Surely we can see that liberalism everywhere has succeeded. We are surrounded by liberal institutions everywhere we look, right? We even call countries like the United States liberal democracies. Fair enough. Most people believe in the premises John Locke subscribed to, more or less. But in terms of the original philosophy itself, liberalism has become a hollowed-out shell. Its foundations are now a pile of sand, ready to be blown away. And I think we can see this in the ideological divide between the anti-SJWs and progressive media personalities like Anita Sarkeesian. Now, for most of my audience, Anita Sarkeesian needs no introduction. This woman is infamous on the internet, despite her ever-decreasing relevance. Anita Sarkeesian is a feminist YouTuber who is very heavily promoted by progressives in the gaming industry. Her content had a very simple message. The sexual objectification of women in video games is wrong because it gives gamers the wrong moral messages, namely that it's okay to objectify women. Therefore, we ought to remove this morally questionable content and replace it with progressive moralizing. The amount of pushback this deceptively simple message received was fierce. But why? What was the anti-SJW objection to Anita Sarkeesian? At its core, the hashtag Gamergate crowd unwittingly operated under the philosophy of English liberalism. See, liberalism as a worldview presumes individual sovereignty. It holds that the individual is the fundamental political unit, and because of this, individual self-interest ought to be the organizing principle of society. This is best seen in Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand, as well as David Hume's idea that reason is a slave to the passions. These unruly, internally generated desires persist beyond man's untutored nature, meaning that all moral agents merely act for their self-interest. Since this is the case, the only way to have a just society is to create a political system under which everyone can openly pursue their self-interest. Therefore, the liberal's goal is to liberate the individual from any arbitrary constraints preventing them from fulfilling their desires, such as tradition or religion. 
From this, we can derive the supreme liberal virtue of tolerance, the willingness to abstain from favoring one's values or comprehensive account of the good over other people's in one's dealings with them. On an individual level, tolerance requires open-mindedness, a willingness to accept the moral views of others as being just as valid as yours. On a societal level, tolerance requires the state and other institutions to be neutral between differing values. This requires strict adherence to a procedure, such as rule of law or the constitution. The state becomes a machine designed to enable the satisfaction of preferences which it never presumes to judge. Politics becomes about which formula or algorithm the machine should use to satisfy the subjective preferences of the population. Now, suppose we took this basic idea of tolerance and applied it to the various institutions that create popular culture, such as multi-million dollar media conglomerates. Ideally, these corporations' priorities should be to fulfill the desire of their consumers. They should simply look at what people want, create products that cater to these desires, and sell these products to people who want them. Then, these corporations would make money according to how effectively they fulfilled the desires of their customers, rising and falling according to the free market. However, progressives like Anita Sarkeesian do not care about fulfilling the desires of a particular consumer base. They are just looking to change the media products to promote certain moral and political messages for educational purposes. They want to get the people to buy their games to support things like gender equality. This violates the classical liberal understanding of tolerance. Under liberalism, the consumers are supposed to be the masters of the corporation, not the other way around. By forcing their particular values onto unwilling consumers, these woke corporations are being tyrannical. Therefore, Anita Sarkeesian and her cohorts are advocates of corporate tyranny. Louis Levi says as much in one of his videos. Point, that's the point of the joke, is to illustrate that fact about these people. This fact that we all know, including the fucking person, whoever it was, that made the joke. They know it to be true. You can apologize all you fucking want. You know that to be the fucking case. You know that that's what this is about. You know that this is all about power to these people. This is about infiltrating and holding power over a cultural institution, that being video games. You know that that's what this is about. You fully understand that this is not about your game, this is not about being a gamer, this is not about being inclusive, this is not about any of that horse shit. This is not about anything other than people that run around looking for things to be offended by to then hold against you for their own end. That's what this is about, and you fucking know it. So like I said, and by the way, this is not the first fucking time they've done this shit. This is not the first time they've apologized for just random jokes on Twitter. Two or three other times, this exact same thing happened. And what this shows is you catering to one side. A side that wants to destroy your fucking company, destroy your fucking games, destroy you for the sake of their own end. Just to control you. That's what this is all about. I'm not doing that. I want you to make your games unmolested by fucking ideology. That's what I've been screaming about for years. And many of us that are hardcore gamers that spend a lot of goddamn money on games, that's what we've been screaming about for years. Is do not cater to ideology, do not cater to ideologues, do not cater to cynical actors that are just trying to hold power over you. Cater to your fucking customers, you goddamn idiots. You know, this is the whole thing about whether it's these people, or Ubisoft, or anyone else, Bethesda, anyone else, anyone else as it relates to this issue of just sell me your fucking game. Can't you do that? Furthermore, Anita Sarkeesian's view of human psychology is problematic to classical liberalism. The arguments she presents in Tropes vs. Women all presuppose that human beings will copy what their role models on television present to them. Therefore, media professionals must recognize their role in circulating norms and knowledge and use that power to promote progressivism. 
This assumes that the desires that individuals have are generated by some external authority figure rather than by some internal process. If that were the case, then the authorities that created their desires would be sovereign, not the individuals themselves. The authorities within a liberal society would be creating desires within their populace and then fulfilling them. Tolerance would be a mask hiding the manipulation of the people by these authorities. This is why the liberal Gamergate slash anti-SJW crowd was so outraged by the idea that television shows can have a bad effect on people. If the liberal understanding of human psychology is correct, then gamers would be experiencing what Hegel once called alienation. Progressive activists would be forcing their subjective views onto gamers as if they were objective. Therefore, gamers have a right to organize and fight back against what is oppressing them. While some would take this to be a reductio ad absurdum of the classical liberal tradition, this thinking seems to be the main driver behind the positions of Louis Levi and others. But if Anita Sarkeesian's understanding of human psychology is correct, then it's entirely possible that video games depicting women in a sexualized manner could be having some negative effect on society, and that, by promoting the liberal understanding of tolerance, liberals are unwittingly perpetuating an immoral system that hurts women. While the Gamergate crowd would talk about the rightness of their worldview based on the whole meme of video games don't cause violence, this worldview is contradicted by a lot of empirical evidence. This study on television role models and fertility shows a correlation between lowering birth rates in East Germany and their access to Western television shows that portray smaller families. And another study from Stanford University found that such programs had similar effects on populations in India. Also, if liberalism is correct, then what's the point of advertisements? Why is it that all these corporations pay tons of money to get people to desire these products if they were simply trying to satisfy internally generated desires on the marketplace? If liberalism was correct about human demand, then all of that money spent getting celebrities to endorse their products would be useless. Now, I know what someone like Louis Levi would say. Oh, Mr. Geocon, don't you know that only stupid people confuse fiction for reality? Art doesn't affect real life, right? Right? Well, I'm sad to say that there are a lot of very stupid people out there. There are a lot of people whose views of reality are influenced by television, music, and video games. Media and art can change a person's perception of reality. Playing Grand Theft Auto might not cause people to go out and commit violence, but it will influence how they look at gangsters and criminality in the real world. The data backs this up. No, it would appear that human beings naturally have what the French philosopher René Girard called mimetic desire. Mimetic desire, according to him, is the tendency to treat our neighbors as the model for our desires. This understanding of desire is presupposed by the Tenth Commandment of the Decalogue, which can be summarized as, you shall not desire your neighbor's goods. In the ancient world, mimetic desire could easily lead to conflict, so pre-modern societies had to put strict cultural prohibitions into place to curb it and ensure social harmony. According to Girard, to deny the existence of mimetic desire is to presuppose the total autonomy of individual desire from external influence. To understand that this premise is false, he says, all we have to do is watch two children or two adults who quarrel over some trifle. Authority figures can manipulate our mimetic desire by controlling who we see as our neighbor. In other words, human emotions and desires are governed by norms perpetuated by authorities, not the other way around. The Thomistic philosopher Alastair McIntyre put it best, norms govern the type and intensity of emotional reactions or desires 
certain individuals should have given their particular circumstance and social role. If you do not know the norms that govern a society, you cannot understand the aspirations and the emotions of the people in that society. These things are understandable only within the context of a social order. And it is in this that we see liberalism's folly. Without the sovereignty of the individual, liberalism is just perpetuating a completely arbitrary system. Liberal authorities are simply creating desires and fulfilling them without justification. In this circumstance, progressives might have a point when they say that certain video games or comic books may be promoting immorality, and they are certainly correct in their assertion that these media companies have a moral duty that takes precedent over fulfilling their consumers' desires. With this, anti-SJWs have no real moral leg to stand on. They would either have to promote some alternative moral framework or embrace a practical nihilism, and I think that's exactly what a lot of them have done, at least concerning video games and comic books. Liberalism failed because it was built on a false understanding of human psychology that, when corrected, turns it into a sick joke. If an individual's desire is neither internal nor sovereign, then Anita Sarkeesian gets at least one thing right. As widely recognized authority figures, media professionals have a direct and pressing role in generating an ethical society that cultivates and directs individual desire towards certain ends. Institutions cannot be morally neutral. They must operate under the assumption that there is a hierarchy of goods. However, progressives are like anti-SJWs in that their moral theories privilege selfish desires. As a result, their morals become entirely predicated on things like freedom or equality. But what is freedom but the ability to act as one wishes? And what is equality but the leveling of barriers to obtaining status? In other words, to desire freedom or equality is to desire power. Therefore, whenever Anita Sarkeesian promotes gender equality, she is educating people into desiring power for a specific group, women, so that the people influenced by her advocate for more power for women. Then, this empowered group can pursue what they were taught by Anita Sarkeesian to desire, which is more gender equality, more power for themselves. This is an infinite regress that results in a never-ending cycle of power-mongering. Some progressives might resort to hedonism as an alternative to traditional notions of good and evil. Do and pursue what is pleasurable is the mantra of hedonism. But what is a pleasure but the feeling one gets from achieving some desired end? Whether or not the desires in question deserve to be fulfilled is a ridiculous question under this framework. So, when progressives teach people to follow the pleasure principle, they are educating people to desire the fulfillment of their desires, whatever they may be. This causes people to pursue the ability to fulfill their desires, power. They will then use this power to achieve more pleasure, which they can only ever obtain by achieving more of their desires. Another infinite regress that results in another never-ending cycle. Progressive moral ideals can only make sense under the assumption that individual desire is sovereign. Gender equality would make sense if the desires of women were sovereign and the barriers to fulfilling them were a form of oppression. But if mimetic desire is real, then this system would make power an end in itself. In a healthy moral framework, power would be a means of obtaining the good of the people. But when power is treated as an end in itself, the actual good of the people is ignored. The progressive understanding of human psychology conflicts with their morals. Why is it, then, that progressives promote these illogical views? What practical purpose do they serve? Who benefits from these vicious cycles? Here, we can employ the work of the political theorist Bertrand de Juvenel. In his book on power, 
he describes the process by which different power centers in medieval Europe would often employ ordinary people to undermine their rivals. The monarch would make serfs into freemen and undermine the nobility. The church would promote ideas like consent of the governed to undermine the monarchy, and so on. This continued until, out of all the groups, the liberal oligarchs were able to win the Game of Thrones. To give you an analogy of what the relationship between a center of power and its client is like in practice, imagine that a pair of newlyweds walk into a bridal registry to acquire some nice drinking glasses. The wife is enthusiastic and wants to buy something. However, to avoid upsetting her husband, she asks for his opinion. What do you think? The wife asks. Do you want this one? Yes, dear, that looks lovely, the husband replies. Then she grabs a second glass and shows it to him. Oh, but what about this? She asks. Hmm, yes, dear, very nice, he says. In this scenario, the wife wanted the first glass, but she didn't want to exert any authority she felt she didn't have. She wants to make her husband feel included in the decision-making process. His participation secures her position as the decision-maker of the pair. But the husband wouldn't even think of buying this particular drinking glass were it not for his wife's desire to acquire it. He might feel grateful that his wife values his input so highly, but at this moment, his input is merely an affirmation of whatever she decides. The wife truly does have power over her husband. There are three net effects of this. One, the wife gets what she wants. Two, the husband feels good about it. And three, the two form a closer bond. In medieval politics, the center is the wife, looking to make the decisions, but insecure in its authority. The husband is the common people that are the clients of the center, generally unmotivated on their own, but inclined to carry out the center's will if coaxed. Once the center and its clients have stomped out some rival to the center, both parties become closer. In the past, absolute monarchs would raise the lower classes to destroy their rivals, but the absolute monarch would at some point recognize that his position was secure and cease the process of leveling. To him, this process is simply a cynical ploy to destroy his enemies. This dynamic between the center and its clients continues into the present day. However, modern rulers have made one fatal error. They started believing their own propaganda. All that talk of freedom and equality was originally just a way of gaining more power for themselves. But what was once a cynical ploy by the oligarchs to destroy their rivals became the guiding principle of liberalism. Now the leveling process is unrestrained by any rational limitations. Because the modern absolute state treats freedom and equality as ends in themselves, it makes the process of leveling a moral imperative. And because it has been so focused on destroying its enemies, it has gained powers beyond the wildest dreams of the kings of old. Progressives like Anita Sarkeesian are continuing the Enlightenment project of leveling things on behalf of an insecure center. They galvanize their clients to petition the center to destroy the center's rivals. The clients gain more freedom and equality, while the center has another rival to its power destroyed. The clients, having taken their cues from the center, use their newfound power to perpetuate this leveling process. As long as they consider freedom and equality as ends in themselves rather than as means to an end, this process will bulldoze everything in its path. Those that stop advocating for the leveling process will be overtaken by someone more radical. So, my friends, 
What do you get when you have a political system that's too busy centralizing power to its center to tend to the actual good of the people it rules over? Well, I believe that Tucker Carlson, of all people, provides a glimpse into the result of this process. Selma is a small city in the state of Alabama. Selma is famous because there was a consequential civil rights march there 55 years ago this spring. You hear a lot about the march. But you never hear how the story ended. People in Selma voted. And good, that was the point of the march. And they voted for Democrats. How did that turn out for them? Selma is now the poorest city in Alabama. It is the most dangerous place in the state. It has the highest unemployment rate. More than 40% of the people who live in Selma are poor. They're in poverty. That's a tragedy. It's amazing there is a city like that in this country. Does Kamala Harris care? Has she ever mentioned real-life Selma as distinct from Selma the metaphor? Probably she hasn't. And more to the point, what has Kamala Harris done to make Selma better? Come on, you know the answer. Progressive Democrats took control of Selma, and that was the end of the story because taking control was the whole point. The lives of the actual people who remained there didn't matter, and they still don't. But to Kamala Harris, this is the blueprint for the rest of the country. The champions of civil rights that fought and defeated Jim Crow were advocates of freedom and equality. That is to say, they were trying to destroy the enemies of the center, Southern segregationists, by promoting their clients, black people. As a result, the center's enemies were destroyed, and the blacks got freedom and equality, which they used to vote for more democratic politicians to gain more freedom and equality. Rinse and repeat until Selma turns into a shithole. In a way, Louis Levi is right. The progressive movement is, in the end, all about exerting power over everything. This is why they are destroying the video game industry and the comic book industry. This is why they destroyed Selma, Alabama. They are only trying to destroy whatever threatens the power center they've aligned themselves with. But then, so is everyone else who advocates for freedom and equality, including Louis Levi. Both the progressives and the liberals will continue this destructive cycle so long as they push for emancipatory politics. A movement opposed to people like Anita Sarkeesian needs to transcend the liberal paradigm. It must recognize that freedom and equality are means to an end. It must advocate for a politics dedicated to goods beyond those that appeal to appetite. It must create a system ruled by reasonable, responsible decision-making, not by some unaccountable leveling process. It must break the vicious cycle that has destroyed places like Selma and create a new order. This means that the opposition to these forces cannot be from liberalism. Liberalism treats freedom and equality as ends in themselves no less than progressivism, so it has the same problems. No, the opposition to these forces must be authentically conservative. True conservatism has nothing to do with free markets and limited government. These are liberal ideas. No, an authentic conservatism consists of nothing more than the defense of common understandings and structures of authority embodied in moral communities, the most important of which are the patriarchal family, organized religion, the traditional culture of a local community, and the nation-state. To the conservative, these moral communities are not means to an end, but ends in themselves, because they are icons, hierophanies, of the goods they embody. If the supreme liberal virtue is tolerance, then the supreme conservative virtue is reverence, the sensibility towards an order of good which disposes one to appreciate its sacred character and to recognize its claims not only upon one's acts, but even on one's thoughts and feelings. Reverence requires us to promote the virtues that allow each individual to obtain the goods of the community and to defend the community against subversion. Progressives promote subversion as a moral good. 
They are a continuation of the Enlightenment liberal project, the project of destroying moral communities on behalf of an insecure center that treats everything outside its grasp as a threat to its sovereignty. Conservatism avoids the problems of liberalism and progressivism by placing the transcendent goods embodied in moral communities as ends in themselves. They then promote moral norms to regulate the actions, desires, and emotions of the people so they pursue these transcendent goods. They recognize the foundational role of authority in the formation of desire, and that's exactly what we need to promote in this culture war. Liberalism, especially the presumed liberalism of anti-SJWs like Louis Levi, is not the solution. Conservatism is. If you liked this video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Have a nice day.